The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the Art Basel and UBS Global Art Market Report for 2021 is out. Is the market's recovery as good as it sounds? Plus an exhibition of Holocaust hideouts in Warsaw and Mondrian's victory, Boogie Woogie. I talked to Melanie Gerlis about the sixth edition of the Art Market Report, what the headline figures tell us and what we can read between the lines. As the exhibition Hideouts, the Architecture of Survival opens at the Zaczeta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw, focusing on the spaces in Poland and Ukraine used by Holocaust survivors to escape Nazi persecution, I talked to the artist behind the exhibition, Natalia Romig. And in this week's Work of the Week, coinciding with the 150th anniversary of Piet Mondrian's birth, I discussed his final unfinished painting Victory Boogie Woogie of 1942 to 1944 with Caro Verbeck, the co-curator of Mondrian Moves, an exhibition opening this week at the Kunstmuseum Den Haag in The Hague, the Netherlands. Before all that, the latest series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, continues with in-depth conversations with artists about their influences and cultural experiences. The latest episode is A Brush With, Mark Leckie, the British artist. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear that and to explore the back catalogue of more than 35 conversations. Do also subscribe to this podcast and give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, the sixth edition of the Art Basel and UBS Global Art Market Report has just been published. Its author is the cultural economist Claire McAndrew, who joined me on this podcast last year to talk about the report for 2020, a year inevitably hugely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So how fully did the art market recover in 2021? I spoke to Melanie Gerlis, an art market columnist for the Art Newspaper and the Financial Times, who earlier this week hosted a conversation with Claire McAndrew and the director of Art Basel, Mark Spiegel, to find out. And please note that all the figures are in US dollars. Melanie, in a way, is it best to compare these figures with those from 2019 because 2020 was just such an anomaly? Yes, I think that is logical because, as you say, in 2020, we saw sales fall by so much. And we are talking about a pre-pandemic and post-ish pandemic. Having said that, We're not in exactly the same situation because of the pandemic. So yes, to say, woohoo, what a fantastic year, not really. It's just we've pretty much gone back to where we were, which in itself was a bit down on the year before. But it's great that we have at least recovered. Should we deal with what's not the same (laughs) then? So what, what has happened in the pandemic that has massively affected the art market? Well, I think on the plus side, you've seen, obviously, online has become part of all of our lives. And we can talk about that being an acceleration. But I think it really is a very, very rapid change from where we were in 2019 when, I mean, there were some galleries who almost deliberately didn't have a website because that wasn't cool. And now that's just, you know, that's just not possible. And the auctions have been helped. And the auctions really were the biggest driver of the recovery this year. They've really been helped by having their online facilities, capabilities and extra eyeballs. So let's talk about the headline figures of the report then. What's it telling us? It's telling us that having gone down from 64.4 billion as a whole, the market then fell in 2020 to 50.1 billion. I mean, these numbers, they are relative to each other. They're not perfect, if that makes sense. And Claire McAndrew has been doing this report for six years, so at least it relates to itself. And then we've bounced back, or the market has bounced back to a bit higher, to 65.1 billion as a whole. What's behind those numbers? is that the recovery has been complete and and better in the auction area, as mentioned, including private sales, which slightly encroaches on the dealers. Whereas the dealers didn't quite make up, I think they lost 20% of sales in 2020, and they gained about 18% in 2021. So they haven't quite made up the, the slack. And tell us about the sort of geographical mix then. Which areas of the world are doing well or as expected and which are falling away a little? Well, you've still got the three main art market centres of New York, London and Hong Kong 
absolutely dominant, I think, between them. They're nearly 80% of the whole market. But you are seeing a little bit of variation within that. I mean, New York is by far the biggest market and growing. And that is a continuation of a trend that we saw running up to 2019. Whereas China has now taken the second spot away from the UK. And for about 10 years or so, those two countries have been trading places. But the UK obviously had a trickier time of it with Brexit. And Claire was actually very clear about one thing about online sales is that you can actually choose where you are affecting the sale. So if you want to avoid a certain tax, a certain VAT, a certain bit of red tape that perhaps Brexit has added, you can just say, actually, I'm going to, I'd rather do the sale from Hong Kong or, or New York. Interesting. So we've seen the UK fall a bit. And then they were very keen to point out, because our Basel has a fair coming to Paris, although I'm not saying it's not true, it's completely true that the Paris market, and we've seen it, you know, has, has had a very healthy year. I think their sales were up as a total 50%, but they've taken a slightly bigger percentage share. So they've gone from, I mean, it's low, they've gone from about 6% to 7%, whereas the UK has fallen from about 20% market share to 17 Right. So, I mean, I guess the sample size is still too small to make a real judgment, but we have been talking about this, haven't we? We've been mm-hmm. saying mm-hmm. that the UK is slipping away a little and that France is on the rise, mm-hmm. but, the, but I guess we'd need a couple more years of statistics really to be able to say that trend is being backed up by the stats. Exactly. And I, look, I'm not here just because I, I live in London. I'm not here to give the UK market a boost. But the start of the year has been okay. There were some good sales last month. And we've got this May season ahead with the London Gallery weekend. And there's quite a lot of buzz about London. So let's see. But you're right. Claire's numbers may not be 100% accurate, but they absolutely back up what we've seen to their helpful Right. In China, there's still a growth going on in terms of more galleries, <laughs> more auction houses, etc., right? Absolutely, yes. So quite a lot of auction houses and galleries launched last year in 2021, which is also incredible because I think China had even more lockdowns than we did in the UK. But their internal market seems to be much stronger than it has been for a long time. Is the fact that the US is so dominant, does it relate to the fact that that's where the most of the billionaires are? A hundred percent. I mean, I think it's difficult to know what came first. Well, actually, I can probably guess what came first. The US has had the wealth for a very, very, very long time, which also means it's just got a much more entrenched, efficient art market. And modern and contemporary art in particular, which is everyone's favourite at the moment, that's the best place to trade it. And obviously, while we're talking about billionaires, there's been a lot of talk over the past month or two about Russian billionaires. Hmm. What's in the data about that group? And can you, in the data, detect what might happen next year in terms of that? Yeah, I mean, there isn't a huge amount. (laughs) I searched for the word Russia through the report, and I think it came up twice. We should say, shouldn't we, that the report is obviously up until the end of 2021, so it cannot factor in what's happened in the news. A hundred percent. And I mean, I think possibly the very last interviews were done maybe in January this year. So even that is before we knew that uh, Russia would invade Ukraine. But I would say that you can see that the Russians don't feature in the millionaire list at all in terms of the percentage of millionaires in the world. They do feature as a percentage of billionaires. I think it's about 5%, which is the same as Germany and India. So these are significant, but nowhere near as significant as in the US and China. I think also, in a way, what the numbers say isn't really what's going to happen going forward. We don't know exactly how many Russians were buying at auction or in the market in general. People tell us their numbers have fallen. I'm not sure how much I believe that in its pure sense, but I suspect we're less reliant on any one country now because the world is so global. And yes, sanctions against potential buyers in the market is not a particularly comfortable place to be and certain areas you know maybe lovely impressionism might suffer obviously again it's not in this report but i know claire has made comment on this Mm. which is what happens during global crises like russia ukraine to the art market does people spending on luxury assets start declining a little well she uses the word discretionary and that is about 
selling as much as buying. And the art market is very reliant on the supply coming. So if things look uncertain, you might sit and think, oh, maybe I'll wait until, you know, until the news gets better out of Ukraine. At the same time, we just keep seeing things coming. I mean, there's a $200 million Warhol, and there's the second part of the Macler collection. There's there's more. There's an extraordinary number of masterpieces in quotes coming to auction in May. But let's see. And that's the thing, isn't it? Whenever we say, oh, this looks dodgy for the bubble, <laughs> the bubble's looking a bit shaky, it sort of doesn't ever quite burst, right? Mm, I'm quite interested in that, actually. I think uh, trying to work out exactly what the drivers are and how much of it, listen, if you're an auction house and you're offering guarantees, that helps in an uncertain time. So I suspect we're going to keep seeing more high, high level guaranteed works because if you are thinking maybe I won't sell now and an auction house is saying I promise you'll get money for this this year that could be tempting indeed um, I and mean, of course you know one of the factors is we've just been through the uh, global health crisis and the people with the money just got better off right tell us about those statistics because <laughs> they're eye-watering and sort of dismaying frankly aren't they well they are other yes I think billionaires their wealth has grown by 19 percent and in fact I think their wealth grew by even more the year before so they have spent the pandemic really getting richer and richer there is this sense of you know post-pandemic I've got all these savings, I want to go wild, let's have fun. And the ultra, ultra wealthy still seem to have some savings left. I think some of the aspirational classes, you know, we we may be saved on a couple of holidays and that's, you know, that's gone already. But if you're super wealthy, they're still spending, they're spending and enjoying it. And that is, yes, I'm afraid that they saved some money and they made some money. Indeed. Obviously, in the statistics, as you say, the sort of headline figures look healthy for the art market. But mm. we know that the art market is not a sort of single amorphous thing. And it's very top heavy, that wealth, isn't it? Is there any evidence of a struggle going on at lower ends of the market? Yes, and I absolutely. And I think this is the thing that we sort of hoped would change that hasn't changed, that we had seen in the run up, you know, prior to the pandemic, this inequality of the bigger galleries, the most pricey paintings, the biggest auction houses doing the best. And I think there was a belief that when we all went more online, things would get more democratic and actually anything but. Um, it seems to have got even worse. And that isn't healthy for the art market as a whole. I mean, the art market totals in Claire's reports, if you look back 10, 15 years, you have a couple of freaky years where you've had big falls. But generally, the market hovers around this 60, 65 billion level. And I think that is partly because of the inequality. The art fair question is still mm. probably the most difficult to predict, isn't it, in terms of what's happening right now? Because, and, and of course, you did a panel with Mark Spiegler from Art Basel and Claire McAndrew. Did you try and tease out that question at all? You know, how's Mark feeling? What, what does Claire think about the art fair issue? Yeah, I mean, Claire had written that things are still problematic. She's found that of the 370-something, that the number has slightly been revised upwards since the last time, but 370-plus art fairs that happened in 2019, certainly 35 of them seem to have disappeared off the face of the earth. And I think about two-thirds happened last year. Now, that's partly because there were still restrictions and lockdowns. Attendance was definitely down and exhibitor numbers per fairs. And she did a sample of all the fairs. And actually, the Basel Fair in Hong Kong had some of the greatest falls. Mark was very positive about the art fair industry, as he would be. But he does also accept that, yes, there can't be as many fairs as there were, and that exhibitors are beginning to make more choices. And I don't think this is settled at all. And going back to what we were saying before about the wealthy having a slightly post-pandemic splurge, I think galleries are having a post-pandemic, I better do every fair I can, having missed out, you know, over the years. And their share of sales, I think it had fallen from 43% down to very, very low levels and is now up to about 29%. That seems to me about right. You know, if you can do a fewer art fairs, but still make a third of your income that way, 
but your profits are you know are not as damaged plus and the report the report says as mark did say this yesterday there are other initiatives there are gallery weekends coming there are collaborations but i don't think this has settled yet at all we haven't mentioned nfts yet um are they factored <laughs> into this report They are in a very dedicated way, although Claire has still kept the numbers separate because her report looks at the dealer segment, auction segment, and, you know, private sales, also, you know, through the auction houses. And mostly NFTs, apart from obviously the big one that we know about, mostly they've not been selling through auction houses. The auction house share of sales that were NFTs is still pretty low. Ditto dealers even lower. But she separated out some numbers, mostly from the Ethereum platform. And it it is extraordinary to think, you know, there were 30 million of sales in 2019 and 11 billion in 2021. That includes collectibles. And I know a lot of people in the art world are keen to separate art from collectibles. But actually, collectibles exist outside of NFTs and are included in the numbers. So it's a trading mechanism. But collectibles, so your apes and your football cards, are taking up the bulk of this market still. But the art backed by NFTs is, is definitely growing. I noticed in your report in the FT that Mark Spiegler referred to NFTs as still resembling meme stocks. I don't know what meme stocks are. Can you explain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I had to look that up. A meme stock is, is, is any stock that is slight over traded because of popular demand. They're just getting very, very rapidly traded. So it's similar to what we're seeing in some of this collectible field. Right. I mean, did you get any sense that Claire would be confident including NFTs in this report in the future, i.e. to what extent will they remain meme stocks because part of the whole culture is that they're going to turn over quickly isn't it so are they never going to be anything other than that i suppose and to what extent do you think they might be incorporated into future reports she is quite circumspect about that the point that she makes is that sure i could include them but then what about works that artists trade among themselves or collectors trade among themselves you know there are lots of other little niche areas that are hard to measure but perhaps you know if anyone can give it a go i think Claire can. So she is looking at, you know, is this market more than what we have defined it as before? But it's not just NFTs. Well, Melanie, thank you for guiding us through the report. You're very welcome. You can read more about the report at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android, which you can download from the App Store or Google Play. Coming up, I speak to Natalia Romick about her show of Holocaust-era hideouts, and we find out about Mondrian's victory boogie-woogie. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. The Art Newspaper's annual survey of museum visitor figures has now been published and it shows that the recovery in this sector is slow. As Jose de Silva and Lee Cheshire report, the number of people visiting museums grew in 2021, with the top 100 institutions in the world having a combined total of 71 million visitors, compared with 54 million in 2020. Although that was a 31% rise in visitors year on year, the overall numbers were still 69% lower than in 2019, when the top 100 museums had 230 million visitors. The Louvre in Paris is top of the list again with 2.8 million visitors, but that's a huge drop from 2019 when it was visited by 9.6 million people. As it prepares to host the 2022 Football World Cup, Qatar is moving ahead with plans to build three new museums. Gareth Harris writes that they include a new institution called the Lucille Museum for Orientalist art and artefacts designed by the Swiss architects Herzog and de Meuron. The Art Mill Project, a new modern and contemporary art venue planned for Doha, is still in development seven years after the project was first announced. And OMA, Rem Koolhaas's architectural practice, will design the Qatar Auto Museum, dedicated to the history of cars. Qatar has faced charges of neglect of migrant workers brought in to build the stadia for the World Cup, but the Qatar government says that the situation has improved since it introduced labour reforms in 2017. 
And finally, the artist Jeff Koons has announced that he'll send a group of sculptures to the moon later this year. As Kabir Jalla writes, they're being sent on board a lunar lander known as Nova C, developed by the private US company Intuitive Machines, and will touch down on Oceanus Procolarum, a region of the near side of the moon, in July. The sculptures will then be permanently housed in a transparent, thermally coated cube. Alongside this lunar expedition, Koons will also release his first group of NFTs. He said in a statement that he wants to create a historically meaningful NFT project rooted in humanistic and philosophical thought. You can read the full Visitor Figures report and more on all these stories on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This spring, discover meteorites from the collection of Michael Farmer, offering a curated selection of 84 extraterrestrial rocks collected from across the globe. Having pursued meteorites for three decades, Michael Farmer has amassed an unprecedented collection. From specimens of the moon to meteorites studied with gems from outer space, this sale offers spectacular examples, impressing even the most experienced collectors. Leading the sale is the largest meteorite to hit Brazil, weighing nearly 85 pounds. Other highlights include a meteorite that contains the oldest matter humans can touch, as well as one that contains the raw ingredients of our planet. With bidding open online until the 6th of April, don't miss the opportunity to own a piece of the universe. Find out more at christies.com. Welcome back. This week, the Zacheta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw opened Hideouts, the Architecture of Survival, an exhibition by the artist Natalia Romic that the museum calls an artistic tribute to the hiding places built and used by Jews in Poland and Ukraine during the Holocaust. The exhibition summarises research by Romic and Alexandra Janus together with a team of anthropologists, historians, archaeologists and urban explorers. It's long been planned, but as the Russian invasion and destruction of Ukraine continues, Romick's show has gained a troubling topicality, and it's being held at the Zacheta Gallery at a moment of crisis in Poland's art institutions, as the right-wing Polish government has replaced museum leaders, including Zacheta's former director, Hanna Rowleska, for ideological reasons. I spoke to Natalia Romick about the exhibition and the wider political situation. Natalia, before we start talking about the exhibition, I think it's worth reminding people of the numbers of people that died in the Holocaust in Poland, Polish Jews. Can you remind us of those numbers? Yes, more than three million people died during the Holocaust. And the numbers of people who were hiding during the Holocaust, more or less, are 50,000 people who survived or in death camps or in a so-called Aryan site like also in a hiding places. So the numbers, like uh, in regards of the great scholars like Barbara Engelking or Jacek Leociak or Jan Tomasz Gross, it's still a lot of to research because we don't know exact numbers, how many, especially Polish Jews, survive Holocaust in a hiding places. And tell me, this exhibition is born of a lot of research that you've been doing over a number of years, is that right? Yes, this interdisciplinary or site-specific research started more or less three years ago together with the Gerda Henkel Foundation uh, as my postdoctoral studies. And the idea was to not only find information about hiding places or think about the kind of reconstruction, how they were built, because we know quite a lot because of the great scholars like Marta Tokarska-Kober or again Barbara Engelking, that, that a lot of Polish Jews were hiding in, the, in those places. But we know very, very little about hiding places themselves, how they were built in which places they are full of the erosion. Sometimes it's very hard to recognize, you know, down their cellar or in the nature that was the hiding place. So my idea was to recognize them and also find more information together with dendrologists, spellologists or the great scholars like, for example, Alexandra Janus to not only find the information, but also measure them, build the uh, cast and that was the beginning, more or less three years ago. And also I believe that uh, contemporary art and the sculpture are very important element of this like general approach about the knowledge of, on hiding places. You've given a broad hint there of, of the kind of hiding places that people used. Can you say more about that? Because it's very diverse, isn't it? They are very diverse. Uh, we will show in this exhibition nine uh, cases, nine hiding places. 
And one of them, for example, is in a small town village, Vishniova in Podkarpatia region, where two brothers called Denholz were hiding inside the oak tree, 650 years old tree called uh, Joseph, <laughs> Joseph tree, because the same tree won the competition for European tree of the year. And we were also researching not only the archival research, but also research in situ, in this place. So, for example, together with a dendrologist and the local people, we found inside the tree 14 stairs, because it's like the empty tree called like a chimney tree, which was like actually the, the, the point of the observation for two brothers called Denholz. And this is only one story. And this is a very good example that in the time that archive cannot show us everything, then we have also this site-specific tools and as an artist, we should use them. And I always said, like, we never work alone. Artists never work alone. So this exhibition will have more or less, more than the 75 people who are working since three years on this project. And this is only one example. The other one is here in the heart of Warsaw, in a grave, in the heart of the Jewish cemetery grave where Abraham Karmi survived the war. And together with Alexandra Janos, we are also using the tools from the archaeological perspective. So we know much more about the hiding place, how it was built. And together with the great specialist Przemysław Kluzniak, we have 3D scans, which in my wishful thinking, and I hope in the future, that they're supposed to be in a public domain. Everyone can supposed to have access to know more about those places. Can you give a flavour of how long these people hid in these places? So you said about the tree, for instance, the brothers in the tree. How long were they there? In this example, we don't know. It's very important to underline that during the Holocaust, people change hiding places. Sometimes they stay one night in the cellar, sometimes one month on the rooftop and one day in the forest. And in the case of Vishniova and the tree, we know that they were hiding inside. But how long? We don't know. But for example, in a cellar uh, in Zhokva, Zhukiev, in Ukraine, Clara Kramer, this sculpture and the case is also one of my exhibition, the Kramer family were hiding more than a year. Abraham Karmi, probably also a few months. So it's very relevant and each story is very different. Tell me about some of the sources that you've used for this. As you say, there's been academic work in the past, but do you have, for instance, oral histories? Do you have letters? What kind of documentation do you have to build this exhibition around? Very different. It's a great question because, it's, uh, first of all, I'm always starting with the oral history and uh, my coalition because I'm also cooperating with the different NGOs and small foundation from the, the small cities. It's very important for me also my previous research on the shtetls and the nomadism because it was a kind of my, my art domain. The coalitions are very, very important, especially in art project. So it's oral history, it's archival research. There are also letters, testimony given, for example, in a Shah Foundation and in the local newspapers. Half of the cases that we are showing in this exhibition are from Ukraine. So this is very important in this case, a coalition with Centrum Histori Miejskie, the center of the Eastern Europe from Lviv, cooperation with uh, Sofia Diak. And without this group of the amazing people, I will be never able to go to the Ozerna cave, which is like 156 kilometers. It's like one of the largest cave in uh, Central Eastern Europe. So it's always archival research first and then site visits. And after site visits are discussion with the specialists from the dendrologists, spellologists, historians. And tell me, how do they manifest in the exhibition space? So do they present as kind of archival projects or are they sculptures? What do they look like actually in the space? My idea was to divide this exhibition into three large rooms. One will be a close-up for the case of the tree. And we will show in the heart of the one first room uh, the cast from the tree, only from the part, because the casts are made like one-to-one. -one. And then the surface of the sculpture is silvered. It's handmade silvered with the conservator from Wrocław, Breslau, Piotr Pelz. And the second room is the room of the sculptures. I would like to show the scale of them. They are, of course, parts like, for example, stone from the cave, which is 
handwritten Hashomer, it's a, in Hebrew is written uh, guardian, uh, because the family, Stermer family was hiding more than a year in the cave, Ozerna cave and Vertreba cave, today's Ukraine. So in the third room, it's very large, and I'm presenting detailed research that I have done with Alexandra Janus and other different scholars. So they are archaeological remains, like, for example, from a sewer system, sewer system in Lviv, which for me personally, that was the most, I would say, maybe not set the momentum in the borderline, which, of course, of the smell and, you know, the, the, the whole mm. story. And maps, visuals, 3D scans, letters. It's more kind of the story from the trip and what we found inside the memoir. It's very diverse, but also I believe the design. I'm also designer working together with Senna Collective. We are working together on this exhibition. It was very important to prepare, for example, tables as they will present, you know, like a diamonds, but they present, you know, like a <laughs> smash torch or some reminds from the ground. But they are always... For me, the sculpture is monument of the trauma and monuments of the, you know, Holocaust. And also the main idea of this exhibition for me is never again, never again war, never again hiding. And in today's time, especially today, when the, a lot of my colleagues, they cannot be here on the opening because they are men and they cannot leave Ukraine. It's a double meaning and it's, it's very sad. I'm sure it is. I'd like to ask you a bit more of that, if you don't mind. Of course, there will be people that will be forming hideouts right now in Ukraine. They will be in besieged towns or they will be in the centre of a war-torn city and they will be creating temporary hideouts. So it must have been strange for you as the artist and after all this research, knowing that that contemporary reality was happening. Yes, it's, it's true, especially sewage system in Lviv where a great group they called urban explorers, they probably will use this underground system again. And I hope not, because Lviv is more in, a, in the West, but still they think about it. And when I was uh, calling my colleague, uh, Miss Irina from Zhoukva, Zhoukiev, she's living under the hiding place where Kramer was hiding. So it's this kind of question mark. You know, it's very hard, especially right now. Yeah. Did they give you any message in terms of the importance of your show and making a show like this in terms of awareness about that? No, I think we are very aware and we are talking a lot with each other. So we are very close. So I think Poland changed very much since last three weeks. Everyone that I know is really helping and, and trying to accommodate our daily life. Uh, this exhibition, actually, we changed the idea. Everything is also not only English and Polish, but also in Ukrainian language. The subtitles, everything. It's a, a bit, but I think it will be also very helpful because we have a lot of refugees from uh, Ukraine now in Poland, especially women with uh, children. So I think it will be much easier to, to read this exhibition. We will also present nine videos, uh, interviews with the guardians of these hiding places and the interview with the specialists. This video was made by Peter Prestel from Gerda Henkel Stiftung. So each case will also present this visual materials. And you also, I think, in the press release, it points out that you, you say never again. But you mean that to be not just in Europe, but globally, right? There is a message that you are sending in a way about refugees more widely. And of course, that's been in the spotlight a lot recently about the difference in treatment of Ukrainian refugees to those coming from Afghanistan and things like that. So can you say something about to what extent did you think of this as an exhibition about a global mm -hmm. issue or something that is being struggled with globally? Yeah, it's a very important question. At the beginning, like three years ago, I'm also a political scientist and uh, from MA time. And I really believe that this political context always matter in art, always matter, even that it's like Holocaust studies. And a few years ago, I was creating the exhibition A Strange, Obcyw Domu, a Polish title, in a Polish Jewish museum together with Ustyna Koszarska Schulz. And uh, there was an exhibition about uh, March 68, where in Poland, uh, 30,000 Polish Jews were basically kicked out from Poland because of the anti-Semitism. And of course, was the student revolution, like in the Paris, there was a 
you know, with the historical narration, it was not art exhibition. And we were using also current politicians, uh, journalists, how they use the language from the 68, this kind of antisemitical, dichotomical language, and we have compared it. And of course, like Polish Prime Minister called this exhibition anti-Polish. So it was like the exhibition where was the largest number of the audience in, in Poland, maybe because of this. And in every exhibition, also in every art that I'm doing, uh, this political vibration always matters. And of course, comparing anything with the Holocaust is very hard, and I don't think it's really kosher <laughs> and ethical. But uh, of course, I'm thinking what is happening in a borderline in, with the Belarus or, you know, like now with Ukraine. So this is, they are like this kind of contemporary and, and the, this element, you're always thinking about it. But especially now, the places like Zhokvia, uh, Zhukiev, Lviv, Tarnopoli and the caves in Ozerna, Vertreba, this is really double meaning. You mentioned it there, but the, the contemporary political reality in Poland is quite troubling from afar and it has crept into the gallery system. You're showing at the Zaczeta Museum and that's obviously been the subject of, you know, the artistic director being changed recently. Yes. How do you feel about presenting your work there amid this crisis, if you like, in culture? Mm-hmm. We had a uh, like a few months ago meeting with Hanna Wrubleska, the previous director, and you know she was working very hard on this exhibition that will happening because it was very hard, you know, like visiting these places in Ukraine, you know, from beginning to the end. It's not easy, I would say, approach to to produce this kind of site specific exhibition in Poland. But in this time now, the next 10 months, Hanna Wrublewska program will continue. Will will continue till I think till uh, November. So then we will see, you know. And of course, I was a one, you know, of many many artists in Poland signing the petition, and I'm very happy, you know, that uh, that we are able to to make it. The exhibition will travel afterwards to the Szczecin, to Trafostacja Szczecin, because two curators of the exhibition is Kuba Schroeder and Stanisław Ruksza. And the exhibition will travel to the north of Poland. And Stanisław is also very much involved in the woman rights in Poland, like, you know, like we are. And I'm very happy that uh, finally, after two years, we are able to, to present this exhibition. And I'm also very happy that the program of Hanna Rublewska is still continuing. And, you know, you mentioned that sort of change in the culture recently, you know, with the advent of the war in Ukraine and that sort of welcoming of Ukrainian refugees. Do you feel any change in the culture more generally? Do you feel it has the potential to create more social change and political change? I hope very much. I'm very close connected with the, you know, like Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. I was a member of the anti-fascist year, like, four or three years ago. We were also producing amazing uh, small unit, mobile unit on the fascist kiosk. And actually every museum that I know with all the new directors are very open to refugees, which is like absolutely amazing. We will see for how long, but now everyone is working to help our Ukrainian friends. Well, Natalia, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much. Natalia Romick's exhibition Hideouts, the Architecture of Survival is at the Zacheta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw until the 17th of July and then travels to the Trafo Centre for Contemporary Art in Szczecin from the 4th of August to the 6th of November. And finally, it's time for this episode's Work of the Week. It's 150 years since the birth of Piet Mondrian, and this week the Kunstmuseum Den Haag, whose Mondrian collection, some 300 items, is the largest in the world, opens Mondrian Moves, an exhibition exploring Mondrian's relationships with his peers and his influence on artists who followed him. The exhibition is co-curated by Cara Verbeck, and I spoke to her about the work that the museum has called the grand finale of the exhibition, Victory Boogie Woogie, Mondrian's final painting left unfinished when he died in New York in 1944. Caro, we're going to talk about Victory Boogie Woogie. It's a very special painting because it's his very last and it's unfinished, right? So tell us more about it. Yes, Mondrian worked almost two years on this painting. I say painting, but there's also a lot of tape actually in this uh, work of art. And it started in a dream. Mondrian had dreamt the composition and he woke up and he told his friend Charmian van Wieghand, 
I had a dream. I saw a really vibrant painting. And it's so different from all his other paintings, so dynamic, so many squares. There are no longer any lines. All the lines consist of tiny squares. And it's actually, it's just like the music. It's rhythmic, it's um, vibrant, it's so joyful. That in a nutshell is victory boogie boogie. Yeah. And and of course, as you say, it went through a very long gestation period. It was made over the period of one and a half, two years or so, right? And even right at the end, he was making changes, wasn't he? Yes. One could even say, well, maybe there have been hundreds of different versions, but one could say that what we see today happens in the last nine to ten days before he died. I imagine him having a fever, but he kept working and working. And in a composition, if you change, especially in a composition by Mandarin, if you change one tiny part, you have to change parts in three other parts of the painting as well, because it has to be, as he called it, a dynamic equilibrium. So he kept pasting tiny pieces of uh, of paper in uh, four colors, yellow, uh, not black, dark blue, blue, red. And, and he just kept on going. And what we see today is what happened well, just before he died. Yeah. So you, you talk about how he was painting or making in a fever. He died of pneumonia, didn't he, on, the yes. fe- on February the 1st, 1944. And, and right up until the point he went to hospital, he was sticking these pieces of tape, as you say, onto the surface and, and playing with the composition. So to what extent do you think he had reached a level of resolution at this stage? Yeah, I think it's the most finished state it ever was in. When Charmian, uh, his best friend, Charmian van Ligans, entered his studio after Mondrian had died, she took a look at the painting... One more time, she knew the painting very well, every stage. She looked at it and she thought, it's so radiant, more radiant than ever before. And he would have wanted to take the, the, um, the strips away and replace them by paint. So now you can actually see sometimes up to 15 layers of tape, different colored uh, tapes. Uh, He had wanted to take those away again, but they're still there. And I think it's very poetic that you can see his final thoughts and and the process. Indeed. And of course, one of the things about Mondrian's finished paintings is that immaculate surface, isn't it? So you have the the areas of colour, and particularly where the ones with black lines, you have that varnished line, which is very distinct and breaks up those areas of colour and and white, etc. Within this, there's a sort of, because of the tape, there's a sort of precariousness about it. There's a sort of, that that you very much feel his hand in a way that you don't in some of the other works. Yes, and you feel his speed, and you see that he just wanted to leave indications like a sketch but many of the planes the larger planes that are um, made of of paint you can see the direction of his brush so the texture is very clear for example every red square is vertical every blue square is horizontal because that way each color caught the light in a different way that was very important to him And soon after it first appeared, it went into an American collection, didn't it? Yes, it did, because he had promised an art dealer that he would give him a painting, and this hadn't happened yet. So yes, it ended up uh, in the collection of an art dealer. It has been in private collections since, and then the Dutch state uh, finally bought it for, well, back then it was the most expensive painting ever bought in the Netherlands. <laughs> Millions. I don't exactly remember how many. It was somewhere but, uh, like 40 million dollars or 37 yes. million euros, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. The Dutch audience was a bit angry. How can we spend so much money on a work of art? It's not even finished. But right now it's considered like the Night Watch, huh? the Night Watch by Rembrandt in the Rijksmuseum. This is an equivalent The Victory Boogie Boogie is our night watch and it's unfinished like we talked about, but that makes it even more poetic and special and unique. 
Yeah. And and of course, because of the tape, I imagine that the, the condition of the work has been the subject of much debate in terms of how to look after it. Oh, yes. Um, because, of course, it's it's scotch tape. He, as you, he didn't intend, as you say, for the tape to be a final part of the picture. So so is it difficult to look after a work? I mean, it's OK. Yes, oh, yes. It's, it's only 70 odd years old, but actually it's in a, in a state that needs a lot of looking after. Right? Oh, absolutely. And we have a fantastic conservator, uh, Ruth Hoppel. Um, she looks after the work, but this also means that we can never lend it. And we get lots of requests, and I would love to see Victory Boogie Woogie and Broadway Boogie Woogie together. Broadway Boogie Woogie is in New York, but it's just not possible. Um, many of the strips um, already started falling off when we acquired it, so they had to be consolidated by our conservator, which he did really well. Uh, but indeed, it's it's very fragile. Tell me a bit more about the debate in Dutch public life, because it was talked about a lot in Parliament, right, as well as among the public. Yes, this is a, a part of the story that I'm I'm not very well informed about, but I know that the, because of the euro, we, we were transitioning from the guilder to the euro. So for this occasion. The government had uh, thought up this plan that would have been financially positive if if we invested money in a work of art. But then the work of art suddenly doubled in price. And then when the state had gathered all the money, it suddenly doubled in price. And it kept on <laughs> getting more and more expensive. And the Dutch uh, public, well, they were grumpy about it. Uh, but right now, uh, I mean, so many people come to our museum, the Kunstmuseum, Den Haag, The Hague, just to look at Victory Boogie Woogie. And it's so different from looking at it in a, in a book. It's totally different. You have to stand in front of it and then you can feel its energy. And of course, part of that energy, as you referred to, is about music and Boogie Woogie is in the name of the painting. So tell oh, us about yes. his response to music when he got to the States where he made the painting. Oh, yeah. When Mondrian first arrived in 1940 in New York, his friend Harry Holtzman uh, made him listen to Boogie Woogie for the first time. And then allegedly Mondrian shouted out, enormous, enormous I think, yeah, that he saw the music kind of as space, an infinite space. And you can see that rhythm in Boogie Woogie and it's expanding and it's almost infinite. It doesn't stop at the borders of the canvas. And when you actually, and we do this during our show that will open the 1st of April, when you listen to Boogie Woogie while you look at Victory Boogie Woogie, you understand the rhythm and the joy of this painting even better. Mondrian was also a dancer. Uh, not everyone agreed on if he was a good dancer, <laughs> but he, he practiced a lot. He took professional lessons and he saw dancing as a serious art form, an equivalent of music and painting, because all three of these artistic disciplines can express rhythm. And of course, it's an optimistic painting in the sense that he calls it victory boogie woogie, but he's there in... New York, looking back at Europe, which is still yeah. in a state of war, right? Absolutely, in turmoil. And he had to flee because he was labeled an entartete Künstler in German, degenerated artist, I think. I can yeah, degenerate translate artist. It like. yeah, yes, yeah. degenerate. Yes, he had to flee. Uh, in London, he even survived a bomb. There was a, a bomb exploded near where he lived. And then he arrived in, in New York and he was safe and he was free and people recognized him for his abstract art. And there he could do what he loved most, create abstract art. So let's talk about your show. It's a centerpiece in your exhibition, which is called Mondrian Moves. And of course, it's an anniversary. It's the 150th anniversary of his birth. But you did your sort of big retrospective show five years ago. What are you doing this time? Yes, it's, it's really different. So last time we showed all 300 works in our collection by Mondrian. This time we actually only show 30 works, but of each of the movements that he was part of, hence Mondrian moves, the early landscapes and the luminism, expressionism, and the style, of course, and his abstract works. And we always juxtapose it to his contemporaries. So van der Leck and van Doesburg. But we also 
create dialogues between Mondrian and his contemporaries and recent work of artists that are still alive that express the same artistic values or that literally say, I'm inspired by Mondrian. So in each room you will find works of art from different periods, but it works really well. I can already tell you it works really well. It's very exciting. And what do you have hanging around or close to Victory Boogie Woogie? Close to Victory Boogie Woogie, we have Frank Stella. So it's all about abstract art, but post-war and even more recent art. We have Remy Jungerman, a Suriname Dutch uh, artist. And there is Imi Kneubel, also very abstract. Hmm. And very colorful, very big. And Isa Gensken. That's great. And so tell me something about how those dialogues work. Because, of course, by showing it in that way, you're in a way showing how people picked up on his legacy and took it further. And how does it work in reality when you've actually got them in the same room? What I found really important, Benno Temple and I, we curated this together, is that even if you know nothing about Mondrian or those other artists, that when you see it, you instantly see a connection. So that could be the shapes or the colors or, or the atmosphere. So you don't even need to read the texts. It's a very visual show, but you can, and then you can read about what the art historical uh, connections are. And I say it's very visual, but we also had a techno piece created, a piece of music by Steven Brunsman and Marco Spaventi, and even a senior nose or a perfumer created a perfume based on Victory Boogie Woogie. Wow. That will be on Sniff in the show. How amazing. Well, Caro, thank you so much for telling us about this extraordinary painting. You're welcome. Mondrian Moves is at the Kunstmuseum Den Haag in The Hague from tomorrow, 2nd of April, until the 25th of September. And this summer, the Fondation Bayler in Basel, Switzerland, unveils its anniversary exhibition, Mondrian Evolution, from the 5th of June to the 9th of October. That show travels to K20 in Dusseldorf in Germany from the 29th of October to the 10th of February 2023. <music> And that's all for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentall and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Melanie, Natalia and Caro. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.